Hello, and welcome to the SCAD Savannah Film Festival, the largest university-run film festival in the US. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Clarissa Cruz. I'm executive editor of Entertainment Weekly, and I'm here to introduce this fantastic group of Wonder Women directors that we have here with us today. Um, we will also be taking questions from some students and the audience at the conclusion of the talk, so everyone will get a chance. Um, I will start with, I will start with Eliza Hickman. Um, she is an award-winning filmmaker born and based in New York City. Her, her 2017 feature Beach Rats won the, won the Sundance Film Festival Directing Award. And her latest feature, Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, premiered at Sundance this year and won the Special Jury Award for Neorealism. Um, next is writer, director, and producer Julia Hart. Um, she's known for directing Stargirl, Fast Color, and Miss Stevens. Her latest, uh, which I just saw last night, I'm Your Woman, um, stars Rachel Brosnahan, and it's about a wife and mother forced to go on the run with her child in the aftermath of her husband's crimes. Let's see. <clears throat> Next, we have Alice Wu. She's a Chinese-American film director and screenwriter. Um, her debut feature, 2005 Saving Face, starring Michelle Krusiak and Joan Chen and produced by Will Smith, um, was critically acclaimed. And her latest, the half of it, uh, uh, debuted on Netflix earlier this year and is a modern-day Serrano story about a shy, straight-A student who helps a clueless high school football player woo the girl they both secretly love. Um, next, we have Felita Lloyd. Um, she, she is known for best known for her hugely successful blockbusters *Mamma Mia* and *Iron Lady*. Um, her latest, *Herself*, is about a struggling single mother who decides to build her own house, and it debuted to acclaim at Sundance earlier this year. Next is Kitty Green. She's an Australian film director, editor, producer, and screenwriter. She's directed documentaries. Um, including Casting John Bonet and Ukraine is Not a Brothel. And her latest is the feature The Assistant, a searing film mm -hmm. about the day in the life of an assistant in the film industry um, who is faced with a moral dilemma. Um, next is Tara Mealy. It's, she's a screenwriter and director who works in both film and television. Um, her latest is the feature film Wander Darkly, starring Sienna Miller and Diego Luna. She's also known for the viral video Meet, uh, Meet a Muslim, in which she created in order to combat Islamophobia. So welcome, everybody. It is such an honor to speak with all of you today. Um, so exciting. I love all of your movies. Um, and let's just get started. Um, as you know, the stats for female directors in Hollywood aren't great. Um, just over 10% of directors in last year's top 100 movies were women. And that's the highest number ever. Um, only five female directors have ever been nominated for an Oscar and only one has won, um, Catherine Bigelow for Hurt Locker in 2010. Um, but still, here we are, here you are with all your films and your storytelling and your point of view and and just doing great things. Um, where do you think things stand today for female directors um, and how is it different from when you started? Um, just jump in and, and let me know. Anyone can, yeah, jump in. Okay, great. I'll go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I would say. Sorry, I think somebody's microphone might be clicking around. Does anybody else hear it? Or is it just yeah, I, I hear. I hear a bit of typing somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I think it's a, a huge difference. You know, I started uh, doing the short festival circuit in two thousand and was at Slam Dance and definitely felt like okay, I've got the short and now I'll go get a feature and that will be the next thing. Um, and I actually tried to get a project made with Lynette Howell, who produced Wander Darkly for five years and could not get financed. This was back in, uh, you know, 2004. Um, and uh, I definitely feel like because of the programs and because of Me Too and Time's Up, um, my career for sure has, has changed. I think it was like seven years ago, I had a, like a salon at my house through Film Fatales and it was 35 women sitting in my living room. And very talented women and nobody could get a, a job. Um, and there's definitely a sense of, you know, do it your own way make it no matter what. But there's also, you know, supporting your family and being able to have health insurance. Um, 
And since then, very excitingly, all of those women have gone on to do studio features, big independent features, uh, pilots, uh, and all sorts of stuff. So I've definitely seen it change um, in the past several years, thank goodness. Not enough. It still has to change more, but right. it is changing. Right, right. Um, I, I guess this, this first question is for Felita. Um, I read that in the early 90s, you told Nicholas Payne that you'd do an opera if you got an entire, entirely female technical crew. Um, and, and I'm wondering, I mean, that, that was a while ago. And do, have, have you found it easier as, as you've gotten more success to be able to make those kinds of um, statements and, and ask when, you, when, when doing your productions? Um, well, I certainly wasn't able to make that ask when I did a model year. And I remember, um, you know, walking onto the James Bond studio at Pinewood as a complete rookie. And there are like 150 men all, all um, saying to each other, good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Kind of almost saluting each other. And then looking around at, at me, I'm just kind of saying, um, good morning. And not know what what the word was for it, you know, a female director in the studio. Um, I've had a weird uh, career. I've been sort of going down the scale, back down towards uh, more low budget. And I guess in that arena, it's easier to make um, big change. I mean, I've just done a movie where we had a 50 50 crew, which um, I don't know how possible that is now even now to sort of swing that with the big studios. I would say things definitely have become much better because there weren't really women in doing kind of huge budget films, but I still think it's it's about economics that we're given more space when there's less risk. Um, as, as the economic stakes get higher, um, it's harder and harder for women to be given the gains. But I, I think things have been slowly better. yeah. Um, can, can I, I, I'd like to open that question to the rest of you as well. I mean, do you find um, in your own productions, um, do you sort of make those um, those kinds of uh, decisions as far as the, who's making up your crew? Um, you know, it's interesting. I When I was directing uh, Beach Rats, I, did, I noticed something similar where all the male crew were referring me referring to each other by their last names but me by my first names and I thought that there was something incredibly militaristic about it um and I I quickly instated that everybody was on a first name basis on the crew um, because it was a weird way in sort of giving power and authority to crew members um I think, yeah, I think it's important to have influence over who is on your set and to be looking for people who uh, bring similar energies and spirits and, you know, uh, type of, you know, set the kind of tone and work environment that you like to have on set. So I think all of that is really important. And I think that, you know, when women are hiring um, um deciding who's on their crew that you know things inherently you know find them a more more of a balance in terms of gender parity mm -hmm. yeah i i it, it's funny I, I echo a lot of uh what uh, eliza just said and i mean to be honest I, I i wish i could take credit for the fact that i actually had a lot of women in my lead positions but the truth is like producers came to me and were like do you want us to only show you women and i was like no show me everyone mm -hmm. and i totally went and it just happened that the people i chose yeah like my dp my production designer my costume designer like it just turned mm -hmm. out that the best people happened to be women i'm far too selfish to be like <laughs> you know but that said having gone through that I do think if you don't have women, at least half on your crew, you are trying not to hire women because I, I will say that like the talent is absolutely there. And I guess for me, maybe it's like what Eliza said about how you're looking for people who you communicate well with. And it just happened that uh, those were the folks and they did an amazing job. So it, it was interesting for me to sort of note that, like I'm definitely a feminist. I absolutely would love to be someone who's like, I'm only hiring women. Um, but I also feel like, I don't even think you need to be that person 
for uh, there to be a lot of parody. Well, it's interesting too, like this, this movie that I have coming out this year is my fourth feature. And my second feature, when I was still like, I've kind of found my crew family by now and have been working with the same uh, department heads on my last couple films. But on my second film, when we were uh, gathering lists of people um, from agencies and just around town, you'd say, I'm looking for a DP. You would pretty much, this was in, this was in 2016, you would pretty much get a list of white guys. And you'd have to say, uh, I'm, I'm looking to hire with diversity in mind. And then you'd get the real list. <laughs> which was very diverse and it is it's very easy to hire a diverse crew if you tell people that you want to and it's interesting because now like when we talk about the fact that there's still so much need for change and more voices and positions of power in our industry i've noticed even since then having made two more films since then now when you say you're you're looking to hire a dp the list is mostly uh, women and people of color. And so even just in the last few years, there have been shifts, but the issue is that those lists might be more diverse, but the people who are making the decisions about who to hire are still predominantly white and male. Mm. And so I think what you get when you have female directors um, or directors of color is people who are looking to hire more diversely. And so again, it's like, we all know those those talented people are out there who aren't white guys. It's just that a lot of the people in the um, hiring positions still are white guys. And so yeah. it's important that we have people like us in the position to be making those decisions. Cause me too, like my whole, all, all my department heads are, I think I have one white guy who's a department head. Cause you know, they're still there. But, still there. <laughs> but you know, most, of, most of the people I work with are, um, are women and people of color. Right. I, that's interesting. Um, when you talk about a list, maybe can can you clarify for for people who may not be as familiar with the process? But um, when you're talking about this list, like who provides um, the list? How is it compiled? I mean, when when is it someone on your team, or is it is it uh, like where where do you all find everybody? A lot of the time, it's agencies, and then mm -hmm. also word of mouth. Like I think once you start to build a community of fellow filmmakers, you start reaching out to each other, like. If you're shooting in New Mexico, like, hey, was there a great um, makeup department head um, that you worked with in New Mexico and you get that list? And mm -hmm. so it depends, you know, at the department head level, it depends where you're shooting. Um, but a lot of the time it comes from an agency or a studio or fellow filmmakers. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, well, is there, I'm wondering, I, I know there are things that you can do personally to to sort of uh, promote more more diversity and equality, um, but is is there something that you think the industry can do sort of industry wide? Um, I, I mean, I, I'm sure there are a bunch of roadblocks to that as well. But is, is in the sort of wish list of things that that can be done um, to help promote this? I mean, do you have any thoughts or ideas on what can happen? You know, I think I said this actually on a panel. Sorry, my earbuds just went flying yeah. out of my face. Um, <laughs> on a panel with Alice, but um, I think so often um, white men in particular are hired on their potential. So if they've done an indie film, they get to go do a big studio film, and that goes across like um, positions on crew. Um, whereas a woman or a person of color, if they've done done something, they're judged on what they've done, and that proves they can do it. And so mm -hmm. they're they're hired only to do that same sort of a thing. They don't get that level bump. So I think I would say across the board, you know, judge everybody on their potential. If somebody could handle five million, let them handle ten next. If they could handle, you know, a sci-fi, let them do a emotional dramedy next. Or you know what I mean? Like judge people on their potential as opposed to judging them on only what they've done, especially with women and people of color. Mm -hmm. I must. Yeah, I remember I had a journalist ask me. Why I he mentioned Eliza and Kelly Rycott and a few female why why female filmmakers are so into realism like why do you want to make every film kind of realistic and I was thinking because no one's giving us the budgets to do anything <laughs> what realism no, we can't we can only make a cheaper like, realistic realistic film these kind of films that are very kind of contained my films one day in an office space it barely we barely change locations can be made quite cheaply and so they can take a risk on something like that but I think people are still kind of 
I don't know, wary about giving, but like you said, like female filmmakers, like money to try things or to giving them an opportunity really that they'd rather feel like was in safer hands with some kind of, I don't know, male essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's interesting. I'm, I'm glad you said something, Katie, because I, I had a particular question about um, once production is over and you're and you're or you're figuring how to get the assistant made. Um, did you find any sort of, I guess, pushback from the industry given the subject matter? Um, I mean, were people worried that they would be put under sort of the same microscope because of of the subject matter of the film being so close to the film industry? <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah almost impossible to get that film made. I mean, mm -hmm. they say that Hollywood loves movies about themselves, but <laughs> not this one. <laughs> so like, it was very, we, I think we submitted it over and over again. We'd always have the female executive at any company be like, yes, we're gonna do it, we're excited. Just let me show my male boss tomorrow and we'll find, we'll, we'll get back to you tomorrow. And the next day it would always be like, no, sorry, my hands are tied, I can't do anything. So I don't know, there's a bunch, there's so many reasons why I can't like point to anything, but I would often right, right. about, oh, that company has a really terrible HR department, or that company has a problem with this staff member, or that, like, they didn't want to kind of examine their own kind of, you know, networks or systems, and kind of, I think anyone that took it on would have to make sure they had, you know, functioned and were safe and fair and equitable the company to work for. So, right. Right. I mean, so so what was the so what was the 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 journey? I guess um, having gone through that. I mean, what what finally made everything happen? Um, I don't know. We found the right team. I think we just found. We also kind of cobbled it together. We got money from all these different places. I must say, I have two incredible producers who did not give up: James Seamus and Scott McCauley, who like kept at it. And like, I think most people would have given up after the amount of rejection we had, but they believed in what we were trying to do. They believed that. I really wanted to do it my way and make sure it wasn't sensational or exploitative or make it very kind of delicate and quiet and sort of very kind of pure in a way. Um, so yeah, we just had to find the right partners. It just took time and just, yeah, that's it. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a great film. Um, I, I, I guess this is a question for, for all of you, so feel free to, to jump in. Um, given the sort of um, some of, some of the the obstacles to to making Hollywood. I mean, as a filmmaker, and then as a female filmmaker. I mean, what helped you? Um, wh how did you get your sort of big break? I mean, what what st what what started everything um, for you? And and um, and who took that chance? And 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 what what started the process? Um, I mean, I can say from my experience, you know, that uh, I you know, went to graduate school, I studied film, there wasn't a big break. I think that that doesn't happen for real people. I don't know for women as much. I feel, I feel, you know, like my career has been built very gradually and I had to self-produce a lot of early work to be able to direct and to create opportunities for myself. And I think that for me, I really love having projects in my life to work on um, and um, I never quite looked for the recognition of the industry for permission to keep working on those projects. And uh, yeah, the, you know, my career was built really gradually. I made a movie for like $40,000 as a first feature. And I embraced the limitations of what I've had to work with at every phase. Um, I, for for your for your movies in particular, I mean, there. I, I, uh, when I saw Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, it was just devastating. Such an amazing, um, amazing film. And I'm wondering. I mean, it's also not a story that mainstream movies delve into to this any sort of degree that that you did. Um, why do you think it's important to tell these these stories? And what drove you to to make this? Um, I, you know, I think the invisible but real barriers that, you know, women are up against every day um, was part of what drove me to tell the story, whether it exists in the workplace, whether it exists in, you know, healthcare, whether it exists, you know, you know specifically pertaining to reproductive rights, um, those barriers are around us at all times. 
Um, and I wanted to explore the impact um, that they have on daily life. And, um, you know, that was, that was the impulse. And for me, I'm interested in taboo subjects and um, that pertains to identity and um, you know, that's you know, something that's been consistent through all of my work. Mm -hmm. um, it, this brings me back to something that you said earlier, Kitty, where, um, where you said, uh, why are women making things that are so realistic? But I, but I, I think it, I, I mean, it's a great answer that the, with the budget, but also, I mean, do you feel, feel this is a question for all of you. Like, do you feel compelled to tell these sort sort of stories that that aren't out there? Um, I mean, do you feel a responsibility, or or just just uh, just compelled to 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 get that voice out there that that you're not seeing yourself? Well, I, I guess I, I would say um, for me because I I've just made two films and they both have queer Asian American protagonists and. They're um, honestly at the point I wrote them both, they're 15 years apart. I didn't think either was going to get made. I, I think I basically just write to understand myself in the world. And like, again, the first film, which came out in 2005, which is like an Asian American lesbian romantic comedy of manners that's half in Mandarin Chinese, like, who the fuck thought that film would get made? <laughs> and so at the point I wrote it, like, it was such a shocker um, that I don't think I was thinking I have this responsibility to put this voice out in the world because I didn't actually think that voice was going to get out into the world. Mm. You know, in some ways, what Eliza is saying about like this big break. Um, yeah, I don't think. On the one hand, I would say I don't think that happens for real people. On the other hand, I do think I that I won a screenplay award contest. And so I guess in a weird way, that was like a, a winning the lottery, right? But it wasn't like, and then a career was handed to me. It was like, I managed to make that film. I finished making that film. I was like, I don't really know what, I, I, what I'm doing. Like, I'm not sure I wanna be a filmmaker. I just really want to make that film for my mom. Mm -hmm. um, and I left the industry. And then 15 years later, there was something else I was writing to explore. I'm trying to explore a heartbreak I had as a queer woman with a straight male best friend, and it turned into the half of it. And again, when I wrote it, I was like, this will probably never get made, but I, I'm just going to write it. Um, and I think that that's, you know, for me, I think in some ways my life drives my work, not the other way around. Um, and so I don't know if that, that answers your question, but I do feel people are like, what's next? And I, I feel the sense of responsibility. Like, oh no, I need to like do another thing. And there's another part of me that's like, you know, if I have another story to tell, great. But if I don't, that's also cool. Cause there are a lot of great filmmakers out there. I, I don't have to, you know, so I, I guess for me, it comes more out of, if I love something, I'll kill to get it made. If I don't have anything, then I'll just, I guess, keep living my life. Right, right. Um, well, that that said, I mean, having that the fifteen year gap between the two films, I mean, what what has changed? I mean, and I I mean, obviously, you you have changed. Um, society has changed, but but I just sort of seeing them side by side, and I, I I've seen both of them, but then just watch. It's been a while since I saw Saving Face, and um, and it it, it just was amazing to me. Um, and and nice to see how how much more acceptance there is now. I mean, did you find that sort of satisfaction? Um, when you're writing the second one? Oh, what a good question. Um, I, I, get, I guess again, when I was writing the second one, it, I didn't think it would get made because I'd left the industry, but I did. One thing I thought was interesting is my first film that came out 15 years ago has a happy ending. And it was the one controversial thing where people are like, is this too happy? And I remember being like, well, I don't know. I believe this can happen, but also I need to see it in order to believe that this could happen for me in, in the world. And what is great is that 15 years later, nobody thinks that ending is too happy. <laughs> like the world changed, right? And right, so that, right. that was exciting to discover. Um, but I, I, I guess, hmm, I, I will say this, that 15 years ago, when that film came out, I definitely had studio meetings. I wasn't really interested in any of the things that, you know, the few things coming my way, but also the big things, my agents really wanted me to be like the next big romantic comedy writer director. Um, and I don't think I wanted to be that. Like I, it just wasn't um, compelling to me, right? This time around, what's fascinating is that this film came out and in some ways, I just don't think I've changed a lot. I think I just do what I do, which is I tell these, stories that have a sort of commercial hook 
with faces maybe you don't usually see. But this time around, everyone's like, what do you want to do next? Like suddenly there's a big buzzword now of like original voices or new voices. Um, and I think I, I think that's good. It's it's it, I mean, I wish it always been so, but you know, it's great better now than ever. Yeah, absolutely. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it to the, the group again. Um you, you, you all have worked on multiple things and, and have had uh, such a wide range of experiences. Um, is there anything that you know now that you wish you knew? Um, is, is there something that is, is there like a bit of advice that you can tell your, yourself, you know, your younger self, like what, as you're going into this industry, what, what, what would you tell yourself and what would you maybe do differently? I definitely, when I directed my first film, had that, like, I, I feel like in society, you know, we, what's thrown back to us as women is that if we're not nice all the time and on time and responsible, like, we're going to be called lots of horrible things behind our backs and men, men are um, applauded for behavior that women are shamed for in literally every industry across the board. And so like, I definitely, when I started out was like, oh, I have to like, I have to like end early every day. And like, I have to be super nice to everybody. And like, I have to do everything perfectly in order to, and it took me like getting to my fourth film before I finally realized that I was, I was spending so much energy worrying about that, that it was taking away from the work and I went through some stuff in my life right before making I'm Your Woman that just took that, like I didn't have that energy anymore. And it was so liberating to just do my job. And like, you know, you safety is my number one priority on set and everyone being respectful to each other. That's the kind of stuff that you have to do no matter what your gender or race or sexual orientation across the board that's obviously a priority on a set but just that energy i was spending like worrying about how i was representing women instead of just doing my job um was advice that i would definitely love to have had someone give me um but it was interesting because a lot of the people that i because like when i was making my first right before i was going to make my first film i was like asking the directors in my life you know, what, 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 what was the best piece of advice that you got when you were making your first movie? And I, I look back on it now and all of the filmmakers in my life at the time were men. And so I, I feel so excited. Like I look even just at this panel and I think about film students and aspiring filmmakers, like they do have so many faces um, and access to those people to look to, to get better <laughs> advice about what it's really like being a woman in charge of a film set. I, I think that too. I completely agree. I feel like when I was younger, I was really trying to behave myself and do whatever it was. Like I'm such a good student and I was like, whatever it takes, that's what I'll do in order to get to be a filmmaker and a director and a writer. And so I kept like, doing for other people and it wasn't successful. And it wasn't until I, you know, made Meet a Muslim, which had nothing to do with my career. I just felt like there was a missing voice in the conversation. Something had to be said and I knew how to say it on film, so I was gonna do it, that like everything changed. So I guess in some ways that was like my breakthrough moment as well, because it got me signed at William Morris, and then I also wrote Wonder Darkly in the same sort of vein, where I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna hold myself up and write what I know and what I believe and what I feel is true for that needs to be said. Um, but definitely, you know, I don't think this is a career where you can really behave yourself in the way that we've all been taught to behave as be good girls. And um, and the same thing goes for striving for perfectionism. I think it's much more important to be brave than to be perfect and, and really be willing to fail and be called out and just pick yourself back up and do you again, you know, and, and not believe everybody's criticisms or not believe everybody's, my kids here, I guess wanna meet my daughter. So, no. <laughs> I would say that also that actually the act of kind of what you, how you put together a crew um, and and how you uh, the ecology of your unit uh, is actually a sort of act of creation in itself and that in some way I think there is a kind of responsibility to um, create a kind of 
an ecosystem, a microcosm of the way the world, the way you want the world to be and to act like that on a unit. And I think it has can have massive influence on everybody. And I think, you know, not being afraid of small, I suppose I, my particular experience is, is coming down to working on a smaller unit where everybody feels invested, everybody has um, a stake. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I, I see. I see the kind of how you behave. Actually, it isn't about having to behave well or or, or falsely, but actually um, to lead in a in a particular way, a, a kind of collaborative way. Mm -hmm. um, a follow up question to that. I mean, having worked on these massive productions, um, is there anything that's being modified for this? For, for the smaller scale that you modified for herself or um, or was it more just just the scale and not not you that that, that changed as, as far as as far as the production I mean, goes I guess I come from the theater where everybody expects to have a voice so I was trying to in some way align the sort of social mission work that I've been doing in the theater with the work th that I'm do in, in film. And so I wouldn't see it as modify. I would see it as actually um, being somehow more in my element. Um, and I don't. I really don't now crave going back to that um, more enormous kind of cavalcade. Um, and and yeah, I wouldn't see it as a compromising situation. I would see it as as freedom in many ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. One one thing I'm I'm wondering. I mean, I'm getting back, I guess, to to sort of bigger bigger picture things. I mean, there are a lot of uh, changes as far as uh, diversity with some of the awards races. Um, the Oscars have new qualifications. I mean, I don't I don't think they they're they're going to be um, implemented. I think in the next season. But do you think that is uh, going to have an effect um, as far as uh, changing things with d diversity, um, or do you think that's more of a response to current times and, and sort of a response that had to be made because of uh, things that are going on in society right now? It's both. <laughs> it had to be done <laughs> and it's going to help. Yeah. I mean, I think the DGA is talking about doing this as well for awards. And um, I just think we have to hit it from all sides, you know? It's like, do everything you can, do every bit you can to make it better because it's not going to fix itself. The people in power are not going to like one day say, oh, great, I'm going to, you know, up and, and hire women and people of color across the board. The, the you know, it's like what he was saying. There's still a white guy that says no at the top <laughs> at the company. So it has to change somewhere. I think everyone in any position of power should do what they can to change it. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I think is kind of interesting that I totally agree. And I think in a weird way, I mean, obviously it'd be great if people in positions of power change, but I also think if they don't change, it's not going to matter. It's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's because I think we're at this moment, we're in a very interesting moment in history right now. Like this year, look at Black Lives Matter or the last couple yeah. years of Me Too. I think we're in this moment in history where people are just saying shit now. Like they're like, I don't care if I get fired. This is my truth, right? And it's towards like what Julia and Tara are saying about behaving. It's like, right, this is not an industry where behaving actually helps. And I think what I'm seeing a shift in is that fewer people are starting to ask for permission. They're like, or like Kitty, like making her film, right? It's like, mm -hmm. okay, this is what I'm making. I don't care. This is what I'm making. And I think that's really just a seismic shift. And so in a lot of ways, it's great if people want to uh, be aware in like certain power structures. But I kind of feel like the bus is leaving the station. Like it's gonna happen. If they wanna get on the bus, great. If they don't wanna get on the bus, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna happen, right? Like I feel like there are people, like I just personally know a bunch of young filmmakers who are gonna, like they're, they don't, they just have a, I, I, like I'm 50 this year. So I just sort of love like these folks who are young and they just have like a facility to their brain and they don't feel the need. To, to you know work in structures that maybe I have grooves in my brain that I think I do. So that to me is very hopeful. And I also feel like, you know, I know that there are strong opinions on either side of the streaming theatrical conversation. And when I hear people say that they fear that streaming is like the death of movies or whatever, I'm just like, I feel like it's mostly 
powerful older white men in the industry saying that kind of stuff because like streaming is actually the birth of so many voices because studios and financiers are able to take risks on newer younger voices more diverse stories more inclusive stories because there's such a need for content mm -hmm. and so i like i it's funny i had a streaming movie come out at the beginning of the pandemic and hopefully i'll have a streaming movie come out at the end of the pandemic. <laughs> that to be seen. Right. Um, but it's wild to have had two movies come out this year one for disney plus and one for amazon and like I was six months pregnant when Disney hired me to make the, like by far the biggest movie I'd ever made. Um, and, you know, I don't know that they would have been able to take that quote unquote risk on, you know, a hundred million dollar theatrical film. Um, right. And so I think it's really exciting that, I don't know. I, I, I think that these streaming services are going to give birth to so many exciting new filmmakers and new opportunities by the way we just have to end this idea that our gender is a risk that it's like a perceived risk that we are women and that we have vaginas like it's insane that's an insane <laughs> train of thought we just have to like put the kibosh on that for people of color as well that that not being a white guy makes you risky that's insane it's right. crazy yeah I mean, one, one thing that makes me hopeful is that there just seems to be a, a lot of uh, anticipated films that are helmed by fe female directors. Um, this year, I mean, even though they've been pushed <laughs> just because of pandemic times and theater times, but I mean, Wonder, Wonder Woman and, um, and Black Widow, I mean, all and um, all helmed by, by female fil filmmakers. And I Eternals. Mean, and Eternals, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, and, and it's, if there's there there just seems to be in in my experience i mean i've been covering in the, the industry for a long time i mean this this year and you know the coming year seems to 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 be a, a great uptick in that i mean how how are you feeling and uh, are you are, are you feeling hopeful um as as far as change happening and and who do you sort of um who do you sort of uh, like like to watch as far as female directors um yourself Well, I'll, I'll just quickly yeah. say that um, I'm definitely hopeful, but also to be honest, like if this had not been called the Wonder Woman panel, I probably could have been on this panel for a while and not realized that it was just supposed to be women. Because honestly, like this year, like when I think about the movies I really want to watch, like I, not like I don't know male directors anymore, but I, <laughs> I, I pick movies based on what I want. And a lot of them are home by women, you know? And like, I actually literally was on a panel for Mill Valley called Mind the Gap, where I didn't realize until the panel had started that it was just supposed to be women directors because it was such an interesting variety. And similarly here, like we're pretty diverse in terms of, you know, there are probably some commonalities, but there's also a diversity to the kinds of things we want to do. Um, and that is something I don't think could have happened a few years ago. Um, and I think it, it will, continue to explode. So anyway, that's that's all I want to say. Yeah, that is exciting to see like, you know, I talk about those 35 women who were in my living room and it was like, we were all like a woman director. And now everyone's being given opportunities and a little bit of money, maybe not as much as we should be given, but to sort of carve out their own voices and to evolve as filmmakers. And, and it's really interesting to see these little uh, paths that everyone's taking and finding their unique voice. It's really exciting. I'm hopeful, yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Well, um, we're gonna start to take some questions from the audience. Um, people have been have been uh, chatting away with some some thoughts um, for all of you. Um, so let's see. Um, oh, hold on a second. The other one. Just a little bit. Of, yeah. Hold on a second. I'm having a little bit of a technical something going on over here. Um, but yes. Oh. <laughs> Um, okay, so let, let's start with, I think Charlene um, has a question. Hi, my name is Charlene Richards, and I am a television student at the Skadden Campus. Thank you guys all for coming out today and speaking with us. I am a producer, and a key area where exactly one producers are is on the subject of leadership for teams that are much larger than us. So that leads me to my question. Uh, what are the most important decisions you make the leader of your team both on and off set? And what strategies do you use to effectively make those decisions over a large team? Uh, 
Well, I would say I think in hiring, like that's your first decision is building that team is so important and building it with good people who are talented and actually love their jobs and work hard at their jobs. Um, and then and then showing up and making sure everyone knows that you are working as hard, if not harder than everybody and that you're prepared and um, yeah, that you've done your work to let them do their work. Yeah, I, I guess I would just say, again, speaking just as a director, I think really directing is just having a point of view. It's having a very specific point of view and not being afraid to express it. Um, and also when you have that team that's gonna help you, I think uh, uh, the key is that um, I'm not afraid of conflict within, like when people are arguing, as long as everyone's arguing because they're trying to make the work better. Um, what you want to steer clear of is uh, if you're arguing based on ego, that's when you want to stop and be like, wait a minute, am I arguing just because I want to be right? If that's the case, then you back up. But otherwise, I think, especially as a woman, I, I, I respect it when someone goes to the mat for what they believe. And I want that in the people who work with me. Um, I'm like that. <laughs> if you ask, like, I will not back off on something that, like, I feel is important. I, I think as long as everyone's in good faith in doing that, um, you know, I'm honestly making a film is a ridiculous thing to do. It's like a ridiculous <laughs> thing to do. So you kind of need a lot of insane people who are all going to, like, you know, hopefully try and move in the same direction. I think also some perspective helps, right? That you're like not like a surgeon <laughs> trying to save someone's life on the table. Like when you get in those moments where whatever it's 3 a.m. and it's raining and you haven't gotten that shot and everyone's like crying in their soup. It's like to be a leader who can say, it's okay guys. Well, you know what I mean? Like to, to stay positive for the team when they need it the most. Okay, great. Um, we also have Mariana with a question. Oh, we can't, can't hear you. Can't hear. You're, you're, you're muted. muted. Uh, yeah, she's, she's still muted. Uh, Do you have earbuds? Because that helps yeah. before coming. Oh, no. Uh -oh. Can she type her question? Yeah, can you type your question? Can you type oh, your yeah, question? Oh, yeah, we got her. Oh, good. OK, there you go. Oh, just kidding. Oh, <laughs> can, can, uh -huh. you can you type it, Mariana? All right. <laughs> uh, we, can, we can do a, a quick, uh, another audience question while she's doing that. Um, let's see, um, this is from Megan and she's a sophomore and she, what, is there anything anyone has advice for any young, for young female filmmakers to stay positive when faced with sexism in their career? So much meditation. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, just surround, and just surround yourself with other women. Mm -hmm. Like just hire a bunch of women and then you won't have a sexist set. <laughs> other women who are directors who've been through it share those experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have Mariana's question now. She's a film and TV major with a minor in acting for the camera. Um, what is the greatest challenge you have faced in your career as a woman? Being a woman. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Believing that you're entitled to actually have the job. It's, it took, took me many years to feel actually. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's like one major challenge oh. that you. Oh. I, th I think there are, yeah. Uh, hold on a second, Eliza. Did, did you want to finish your thought fully? I, I think we're having some hearing issues. With me? Uh, um, I, no, no, I think, uh, yeah, I think, uh, were, you, were you finished? Fully yeah, done? that's fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. being inside. Okay, go ahead. I, yeah, you were having trouble hearing, but uh, no, we can hear you now, Eliza. Uh, I can, yeah, yeah, there says um, the stream yeah. isn't able to connect. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. Um, I, you know, I don't know if there's one, you know, big looming obstacle that's ahead of you in your career. 
I think that there's a lot of, you know, systemic barriers ahead. And I think that you have to focus on, you know, making work and surrounding yourself with people who support the work, the process of making it, and you. Um, and a lot of those people, you know, right now are your peer group at SCAD. Um, and then, you know, I think focusing on how to take those relationships to continue making work when you graduate is what you should focus on. I don't think you should worry about like the big structural changes that need to happen in the world. I think you need to worry about the next film that you're going to make and how you're going to continue to make work outside of school and to use the relationships that you have to create a pathway into the industry. And I do think what Felidia was saying, just to make sure she heard, because it's so important, yeah. it is really a mind game that you've kind of internalized, right? Some of the sense of you don't belong as a director, that this isn't for you. Um, and I think that's a really good point to just get past that. That's a huge hurdle. All right. Um, well, thank you, everybody. It looks like we're going to, this is all the time we have for today's conversation. Um, a big virtual round of applause for all of our participants. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Yeah, and thank you at home for your participation today and for supporting the art forms that make movie magic a reality. Enjoy the rest of the SCAD Savannah Film Festival. Thank you, everybody.